Okay, we might just um, kick off because conscious of everybody's time. Um, so my name is Emer Joyce. I'm um, a director with Grand Thornton, uh, based in Galway. Uh, recently joined the team as a head of tax for BMW. Um, so I know some of the people who were on the call here I've met you before. Others I haven't met you yet. So nice to meet any of those who I haven't met before. Um, so I'm joined today by my, my colleagues Elaine Flynn who uh, does a lot of work on our income tax and global mobility side of the business, and Niall McBride, who does a lot of work with um, our financial services end of the business, um, with pensions and life policies, et cetera. So they'll both take you through the tax upside updates in that area. The update I'm going to provide you is around the temporary wage subsidy, which is, everybody knows has continued to evolve as recently as this morning. Um, so we'll go through that in a little bit of detail. Um, so in terms of... Um, so this first slide here is just a brief overview of Grand Thornton and the firm itself and where we um, have we've offices in seven uh, locations across the country employing about 1450 people at this stage and continuing to uh, grow. So in terms of the temporary wage subsidy I think it's fair to say that this has has dominated the media in, in uh, various forms since it was introduced on the 26th of March. I'm not intending to go over um, a very detailed in-depth um, review of the earlier iterations of the scheme. What I'm going to do today is just give you a very high level update on where things are at and, and uh, what we can expect to see from now until the scheme ends. Um, obviously the initial 12 week period has come and gone and the Minister for Finance has extended the scheme now for qualifying employers to the end of August 2020. Um, we're still waiting for some clarification on some of the revisions to the operations of the scheme. As I said, there was an update um, last night, um, which we'll go through in, in a little bit um, just to cover that off. So in terms of the eligibility criteria, these have remained unchanged since the first version of the scheme was launched. So essentially, there was four uh, qualification uh, conditions for employers. The first being that they needed to be experiencing significant economic disruption due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, to be able to demonstrate the satisfaction of revenue decline in either orders or turnover in quarter two 2020 of at least 25%. Um, and thirdly, then to be unable to pay normal wages or outgoings fully. Um, but this is going to become more of a, a point that employers need to be mindful of as we move into quarter three, and we'll have discussed that in a minute or two. And the last point was that they wanted to retain their employees on the payroll. Registration was quite simple, done through Ross um, on a self-assessment basis where the employer made a declaration that they met the qualifying conditions and revenue were at uh, pains to point out this was not a declaration of insolvency, uh, which had caused a little bit of um, legal questioning at the start. Um, in terms of eligibility, once you are an eligible employer, you can participate in the scheme for any eligible employees and they were employees who were on your payroll at the end of February 2020. Um, and it applied where they were working reduced hours or who have been temporarily laid off by reason of the pandemic. Um, so again, the base period that we were looking at all along has been the January, February 2020 period. And you looked at what the average net weekly net pay for employees was in that period. Now in the first period up to the 4th of May, it was up to the employer to calculate that, but the revenue since that have updated all the CSV files to ensure that uh, the correct uh, figures were being used. And they were updated at this stage on a daily basis and the expectation from employers was that um, they would make best efforts to maintain the employees incomes close to normal net pay as possible uh, but they were not obliged to do so however the revenue did have the expectation as did the minister for finance that employers who had cash reserves would make their absolute best efforts to do this um, no age restriction once you were an eligible employee as in on the payroll you could qualify it caused some um, questioning where people might have been on, in receipt of, say, an old age pension. They um, wouldn't qualify, but were employees that did qualify for the, the um, sorry, they didn't qualify for the unemployment payment, but could qualify for the TWSS. Uh, from the 16th of April, then, it was extended to include salaries that were in excess of 960 net per week, um, where they had taken a pay cut of at least 20% um, since the pandemic had happened. And... Um, in terms of employers making top-ups, it was important that you didn't top up in excess of the permitted top-up onto the subsidy scheme. And again, there's tapering now applying from the 4th of May where top-ups exceeded that um, period, that figure. Um, employers that employees that weren't on payroll due to say maternity leave or adoptive leave were initially excluded from the scheme. However, the Minister of Finance did announce 
in late in early June, I beg your pardon, that those people could now be included on the scheme um, and that it would be backdated. So that was a very welcome announcement for a lot of employers who fell into this category. Um, I suppose the cash reserves piece has caused a number of questions from the beginning of the scheme. Um, because as I mentioned already, one of the uh, conditions was the ability to pay normal wages. So I suppose the question being asked of us initially by clients was, well, we do have cash reserves. Um, where do we stand with this? Our turnover is down by 30, 40, 50%, whatever the figure was. And revenue, to be fair, were quite clear in saying from the, from the outset that just because a business had cash reserves didn't preclude them from eligibility for the, for the scheme. Um, and I suppose they have now come out further in terms of the continuation of the scheme that they would expect to see wage subsidy amounts start to taper as workers return to normal working hours firstly and second of all as an employer's cash, cash flow, the day-to-day -day cash flow reserves start to improve. Um, so in terms of the employees starting to return to nor normal working hours, this is particularly relevant where employees are paid on an hourly basis rather than a salary basis. Um, and I suppose it did cause some problems where in some sectors, for example, the agricultural sector, the early, the January, February periods for pay would have been quite low, given that they were at their out of season period as such from employees perspective. And as they now needed their employees to come back to work on a more full time basis, um, that was causing problems when you looked at the tapering of the subsidy. So the expectation of revenue um, is that over time, as employees are paid correctly for the hours that they worked and contractually they need to be paid for the hours that they're worked, um, that the tapering will apply to reduce subsidies down to zero. Um, and I suppose in terms of the actual contribution to the wages and the ability of the employers to come off the subsidy, um, that is going to be very much linked to the cash flow in the business starting to improve. And I think it's, it's going to be very important for employers and for, for you know, for you and conversations with clients um, to be advising that they should be keeping very good records now as to the rationale for continuing to claim the scheme where they're back to normal trading. Um, the next part of the slide here, we've just outlined the operational phase of the scheme, which as I said, men mentioned earlier, starts on the 4th of May in terms of the level of subsidy. Um, I'm not going through that in a lot of detail. It was just included here more for information purposes. Um, if there's any particular questions on it, I'm happy to take those in the Q&A section at the end of the session. And sorry, actually, just to say all of these slides will be circulated once the um, session closes today. Um, the guidance notes for revenue have been up, as I said, literally last night, they were updated to version 16. Um, and the main updates in version 15 and, and 16 now are covering on certain points. So in terms of rehiring of employees that were previously laid off and um, the revenue have now outlined in detail how employers should um, rule um, to make it as, as straightforward as possible. As I mentioned already, the CSV file is updated now on a daily basis. So as people are coming back from either the uh, from the unemployment benefit, the PUP, they will be now included on that CSV file um, and they will be notified, the revenue will be notified to make that update as employers uh, notify them. Again, in terms of multiple employees, this was causing some questioning as well. So Revenue have now confirmed that they consider earnings from all active employments, which includes pensions and retirement benefits for like annuities, um, are to be all included when looking at the CSV file figures. Um, there was questions earlier on as to whether or not people could be getting multiple, uh, multiple employments, whether or not they needed to be combined or whether it was done on a per employer in, uh, payroll basis. Um, so effectively now what they're doing is they're treating each employee on their, in their own right and they will give the CSV file to the most appropriate employer. In terms of employees returning from maternity leave, adoptive um, or parental leave, again the um, uh, revenue have covered off here in, in terms of the eligible employees can request to treat an employee as eligible employee for the entire period of the scheme and they will backdate that. So there's a new system being set up to accommodate such employees. So you do need to link in with the revenue and the revenue then will check with the DESP to confirm the status of the employee during that period. Um, and um, again, it's, it's very much a case of bringing it back to when the subsidy came in on the 26th of March. The next thing was looking at retirement benefits. Um, again, we got confirmation from revenue in that update that the retirement benefits or pensions paid during the period that were subject to income tax paid through PAYE are also now taken into account when calculating average weekly net pay. Um, similarly, the um, use, use of the information, the CSV file, 
where an employer is opting not to use a CSV file, they're really running the risk of using incorrect figures um, and also making errors where there's multiple employments or benefits being received by the employees. There was further additions to the um, Ross screens in terms of the access to the information that you could get. Um, and in terms of inputting information and drop downs, there's quite a lot of information there where the employers should now be very easily able to reconcile payments they've received as against uh, what they expected to receive. In terms of benefit and kind, again, Revenue have included some information here on the process for resuming the reporting of BIK where an employee is moving off the TWSS. So as we, were, um, we would have discussed before, during the period of the subsidy, employers have the um, ability to suspend the operation of the BIK and Revenue are announcing that it should be spread over the remaining payrolls for 2020. They're further saying that where it's not achievable, suspended BIK should be reported by the employers before the year end um, and, and, and tax at that stage. And similarly, where an employment may cease before the end of uh, 2020, the balance of any untaxed BIK should be included in the final payroll for that individual. Um, the, a lot of reconciliation work has yet to start from revenues perspective. Um, and we'd have a lot of clients coming in with queries where they, um, the, this, either the subsidy wasn't processed or it was lower than expected. Um, again, as I said, revenues notes um, going out to employees are now, or to employers are a lot more detailed now as to why they maybe didn't get the level of subsidy that they expected. Um, in terms of updates that have come out in the last 24 hours, which I haven't updated the slides for, um, one thing was that in terms of employees now coming back from the PUP payment, in order to avoid triggering uh, tax refunds for the period that they were on the PUP, Revenue have now said that they will operate them on a week one basis. Now, this was something that we asked them to do back in, in um, April to avoid the refunds triggering for people who were on the subsidy scheme um, where they were getting refunds. The subsidy itself not being taxed now, but taxable on a year end review. We had spoken with Revenue about this and asked them whether or not it was possible for an employer to operate a week one basis for employees to avoid these refunds happening. And the response we got at that stage was to not do that um, because the matter, uh, sorry, the issue of being on a week one basis was very much a matter for employees directly with revenue. So they've moved on a little bit in, in accepting that. Unfortunately, I think they've done it probably a little bit too late because a lot of people have received refunds and are going to have tax bills when there is a review of that subsidy done later in the year. The second piece was around redundancy. Initially, the revenue had uh, said that if you were intending, so again, I suppose the fourth condition for the subsidy eligibility from the employer's perspective was that you intended to retain the employee on your payroll. So obviously, once a decision was made to make somebody redundant, the question arose, well, I'm not intending to keep this person on payroll, so should I cease operating the subsidy? And the answer up until last Friday from revenue had been, yes, you should take them off the subsidy once that decision has been made. They have now acknowledged that that could cause uh, financial difficulty for employers and in order to avoid injury for the employee or if the employee in holiday pay or time in lieu of say overtime that would be marked pre-COVID, uh, that cannot be, the subsidy cannot be operated by that piece. Another thing that has come out this morning is the fact that revenue are now starting to do reviews of all claimant companies who have claimed the uh, wage subsidy scheme um, to establish whether or not the, the drop in turnover has been sufficient to meet the eligibility criteria and secondly in terms of how you operate the scheme whether there was any errors or any gaps there um, they're saying it's not an audit um, however the fact that these these checks are going to start now um, has come under a bit of criticism from the Institute of Chartered Accountants certainly this morning that the timing of it isn't good that businesses are trying to get back to trading um, and that revenue had indicated at the outset that they would uh, be reserving the right to do inspections and checks once the scheme had closed. Obviously the scheme is still running um, until the end of August so I suppose that's a little bit of a change in, in approach from revenue. They have been clear to say it's not to be regarded as an audit um, and I suppose the advice we've been given to clients of ours where they've come to us and said look I don't think our turnover is going to be down by the 25% and um, or we've made an error in how we claimed it in a particular month and the approach we had taken with them was you know, go back to my inquiries, notify revenue of the error. They will be going into the reconciliation phase. And once that phase starts, they will be able to um, liaise directly with the employer on that basis. Um, the next thing I just want to look at very briefly is around the revenue debt warehousing. 
again, uh, we're waiting on legislation to be enacted to cover this off. We, I understand from revenue that that should be done. There's draft le legislation um, now available, but it's, it hasn't been circulated because it's, it's subject to a little bit of debate at the Shannon level, I understand, and obviously we're missing a few senators currently for that to happen. Um, but my understanding is it will be enacted as soon as there's a, a government capable of passing that um, piece of legislation. I understand it's going to be quite short in, in length and it really will be just supporting, I suppose, where Revenue had previously announced the suspension of any debt collection uh, for late payment of, of um, that and payroll taxes for January, February and March, April. That has now been extended to include your uh, May, June, um, VAT and PAYE, PRSI liabilities. Um, doesn't include corporation tax or other income taxes. Um, it's purely the VAT and payroll taxes that are included at the moment. Um, and it, businesses will be required to file the revenue returns. So it's the expectations that you will still file your return on time, even through the um, period. Um, it's expected it will be available to all employers who met the uh, turnover decline criteria. Um, they have said that where a business is unable to file returns in order to avail of it, of the warehousing, um, that it will be important that they submit the returns based on the best estimates. Um, in terms of how it's going to operate, there's going to be three phases to it, um, and they are effectively, um, I'll go, sorry, I'll come, sorry, qualifying businesses in terms of where we're at here, will be anyone who qualified for the wage subsidy should be able to avail of this scheme. Um, and as I said, it's available to all SMEs automatically, and where you're not an SME, you should approach revenue directly. Um, your own revenue district directly to uh, get agreement from them that you can avail of the scheme. In terms of the phases of the arrangement, as I said, it's in three periods. Period one will be the COVID-19 restricted period, trading period, plus two months of normal trading. So when, when your business can reopen, I suppose the question arises, what is normal trading? Um, if you talk to someone in the hospitality sector, they'll tell you that they don't expect to get back to normal trading to the end of the year. I do expect that once the legislation is available, revenue will clarify what they define as normal trading for that uh, for the purposes of this uh, period. Um, you know, as a, a revenue have in their guidance note already mentioned that it will vary depending on the sector that you're working in. So effectively during that period, there'll be no debt collection or interest will apply to these periods, but tax returns should be filed on a current basis. So then we move into period two, which is 12 months from the end of phase one. Um, of it and during period two no interest or collection will apply to any of the period one debt however all current debt must be kept up to date so both in terms of filings and in terms of payment of those taxes it'll be important that businesses keep those up to date so that effectively the liability that's falling into the warehousing arrangement is purely the COVID-19 restricted trading period um, debt and then period three will start 12 months after the, or sorry, start at the end of the 12 month period, which is covered by period two, and will last until all of the COVID-19 related debt. So that VAT or payroll taxes that have built up in period one are paid. And the rate of interest that will apply to those taxes will be 3% per annum. So this obviously compares quite favorably to um, the normal rate of interest that's supplied by revenue. Um, as I said, it's incumbent on all businesses to ensure that their taxes going forward are kept up to date and that there is no, um, that, that the taxes are both filed and paid on time. Um, just a couple of points on it, in terms of um, an SME for the purposes of this definition is it a business where the turnover is less than 3 million. Um, tax clearance certs will not be impacted by a business availing of the, the tax debt warehousing under the arrangement. Um, where you're ex expecting refunds of taxes or repayments of any taxes, uh, they will still issue, notwithstanding your availing of the uh, warehousing arrangement for your period one debt. Um, you can obviously opt to have an offset done of any refunds against those COVID-19 liabilities if the, if the employer wishes. Um, and um, as I said, it does not apply to income tax or corporation tax. And as we understand it at present, there's no intention that it will be extended to cover those taxes uh, at the moment. Um, so that pretty much brings me to the end of my section. I'm going to pass you over now to Elaine um, and she will take you through some uh, personal um, tax updates. Thank you. Thanks, Seymour. Great. So I'm just going to go through some of the more relevant income tax matters um, that we're discussing with clients at the moment um, and, and some, I suppose, topical queries that are coming in from clients. 
Um, so there's a lot of discussion around funding and cash flow management at the moment. Um, cash flow management, I suppose, is one is generally acknowledged as kind of one um, one of the most pressing concerns for small and medium type business owners. Um, and I suppose particularly in the current environment, it requires a lot of monitoring um, and a lot of management. Um, some of the options being considered by various businesses at the moment are around cash projections. So um, looking at kind of actual versus forecasted um, outgoings on a very regular basis, um, doing an, an analysis of best and worst case collections um, to kind of manage your cash flows actively um, and, and, and doing that regularly. Um, another option businesses are looking at is reviewing all outgoings, um, looking at working capital requirements in general, uh, reviewing partner director remuneration, staff remuneration, and also deferring tax payments. Um, just in terms of tax payments, I suppose with the limited cash that businesses have access to at the moment, and um, they, they don't want to be using the cash to make tax payments. So, um, so as Emer spoke about the debt warehousing um, initiative will, will, will be very helpful in supporting some businesses here. Um, other initiatives are and, and topical areas of discussions are around kind of supplemented outgoings for wages. So um, social welfare supplements for workers that may be on reduced hours or short time working um, and also the wage subsidy scheme. So um, again, with the wage subsidy scheme, as, as Emer mentioned, it is important to continue to monitor your cash flows and to ensure that you're still meeting requirements and that your turnover is still down by the 25% um, and that you haven't resumed back to kind of normal trading in order to continue claiming the scheme. Um, then some non-cash considerations that we're looking at or, or talking to clients about at the moment um, around kind of staff holidays and um, study leave is, is quite a topical one um, and a freeze on hiring as well. Um, then an, another point um, which, which has come up and we probably will expect to um, talk more about it in the coming weeks and months um, is a change in the accounting year end. So, um, so a company in particular can um, change their accounting year end once in, in five years and uh, they can extend it by six months. So for instance, a company with a December year end could extend it out to June 2020 to capture the first couple of months of um, 2020 where poor trading um, and, and that can be brought into the accounts. So um, we're, we're definitely expecting kind of more conversation around that um, in, in kind of the coming weeks and months. Um, the next point then is around preliminary tax considerations for 2020. So it is worth investing some time in calculating a, a good estimate of 2020 preliminary tax um, based on 90% of current year profits. So um, it, it is worth kind of getting up to, up to date management accounts um, and investing some time in estimating what that might be in order to help manage cash flow expectations. So an, another area um, of discussion is around kind of trading losses. So this, I suppose, is becoming more relevant and we'll, we'll see a lot more of it throughout 2020. So, um, so really this, this slide is just kind of summarising the key points in relation to trading losses, um, particularly around the more popular ones for current year losses, capital allowances, um, carry forward of losses, and terminal loss relief where the business has ceased trading. Um, and again, in reminding ourselves around um, specific rules for farming losses, limited partnerships um, and land dealing and that kind of thing, um, that there are, I suppose the rules can be tricky in, in certain areas. So, so it is good to kind of um, to, to go through them just to have them um, have them to hand. Um, another area which I suppose will become particularly relevant in calculating preliminary tax for 2020 is around rental losses. And um, so there are specific rules around rental losses um, where, you know, you can only carry them forward. They can't be carried back to a prior year and um, the rental loss must be used to the maximum extent possible in the earliest year. Um, they can be carried forward indefinitely, even if the individual ceases to have rental properties. Um, and rental losses of one spouse can't be offset against rental profits of another spouse. 
and then case five capital allowances uh, may be claimed in priority to rental losses. So I suppose that the, the rental losses is an area um, which will, is becoming more relevant in calculating 2020 preliminary tax um, and, and it will be very relevant when we're looking at 2020 kind of personal tax returns. Um, the next area then is around capital losses. So again, it's just really familiarising ourselves with these rules. Um, clients, you know, I suppose values are low at the moment. Um, clients that are considering making disposals for capital, um, capital gains tax purposes and uh, will be considering kind of losses arising um, and rules around those. So, so we'll definitely see more queries coming in in that in the near future. Um, and it would just particularly want to be, I suppose, conscious of rules in relation to disposals to connected persons um, and subsequent uses and that kind of thing. Um, so in terms of kind of personal tax queries, really like the main discussions at the moment are around kind of cash flows, um, 2020 preliminary tax, losses, how to use them. Um, for personal tax and corporate tax, the, the different rules um, regarding the losses, you know, where, where is it can offset them against other income or carry them forward. Um, again, rent then, how, how it's taxed on a receivable basis, even if it's due but not paid, um, unless it's a bad debt. So um, again, we're, we're seeing kind of queries starting to come in from clients around this area and we do expect to see a lot more. Um, so it's kind of some key takeaway points there um, and things that we're looking at at the moment ourselves for our clients are getting 2019 accounts and tax returns completed as soon as possible. So we, we know what the cash flow requirements are and we, we can plan for that early. Um, the, there has been no change to the income tax deadline for 2020 for 2019 as of yet. So, um, so if, if there is a refund due, it's good to get the 2019 tax return filed early, collect the refund to help cash flow. Um, if the client is, in, is considering making a pension top up um, or it, it has preliminary tax to, do, to pay for 2020, they still have some time to consider that up until the 31st of October or, or 12th of November for the extended filing deadline. Um, and again, preparing interim accounts for 2020 and having a year to date overview and um, kind of being on top of your cash flow and estimates. Um, and again, looking at your accounting year end to see about the possibility of extending there. And um, so, so there are kind of some some key takeaway points that we're looking at for our clients and and um, and will be will be very relevant kind of in the, the coming weeks. Um, then just some additional income tax considerations and um, some, some typical topics that we're seeing queries around at the moment. Um, so many employees are now working from home temporarily. So revenue have released guidance um, that they've said, you know, employers can pay um, up to 320 per day tax free to employees. Um, it, in order to cover costs for working from home, um, but the employer is not ob obligated to do this. Um, so employees we may make a claim for additional costs um, where they're not in receipt of that 320 per day from the employer. So the employees may make this claim through their personal tax return um, on the basis that the costs are incurred wholly exclusively and necessarily in the performance of their employment duties from home. Um, now they can't automatically just claim a, a flat rate of 320 per day. The expenses need to be supported by receipts um, and anything reimbursed from the employer must be deducted from the claim. So we are getting some queries from employees and employers around that area. Um, another point then is just in relation to individuals tax residence position. So um, it, I suppose it, individuals tax residence potentially could be impacted by changes in work locations due to um, COVID-19 um, which can, can give rise to unforeseen kind of payroll obligations or income tax obligations. Um, in, in revenues guidance they have provided for force majeure circumstances during COVID-19 um, so basically they're, they're where an individual is prevented from leaving Ireland um, due to the current circumstances um, 
that on, on their predetermined date of leaving Ireland, um, revenue will, would be prepared to accept kind of on a case by case basis um, that, that those days are not counted towards their Irish tax residents. So um, again, I think we'll, we'll see that being looked at on a case by case basis and probably more to come on that um, once, once we're looking back at 2020 income tax positions um, and income tax returns. Um, then finally, we, we mentioned that the personal tax filing deadline for um, individuals has not been extended um, for 2019 tax returns, um, but there has, however, been an extension to the deadline for um, some employees who receive real time credits through payroll for foreign taxes paid on RSUs. Um, this is obviously quite a specific area, so may, may not apply to a lot of individuals, but it's just something to be conscious of. Um, Revenue had previously confirmed that the 31 March deadline for filing these income tax returns would be extended to the pay and file deadline of the 12th of November. Um, and then the associated employer notification should be submitted as soon as possible. Again, that they're not imposing the deadline of the 31st of March um, and they're extending that to the pay and file deadline of the 12th of November 2020. Um, great, so that, that's everything in terms of current income tax update um, and I'll hand you over to Niall for, for an update around pension planning. That's great, thanks Elaine. Uh, my name is Niall McBride and I am a financial advisor in the Wealth Management Division. Um, a lot of what we do with clients for, from a financial planning perspective is around uh, retirement planning and the use of different structures available to um, to optimize that um, for them. So what I want to look at is a, the differences between company pension plans and personal retirement savings accounts for small business owners or medium-sized business owners and how that can be used um, to efficiently plan for retirement. So the big differences in terms of a company pension versus a PRSA is around the funding capabilities that you'll have uh, from, from a company perspective. So just to give you an example, uh, if we take a 50 year old a company uh, owner with a salary of 115,000, let's say they have 10 years service and they have 200,000 in pension um, benefits already accrued. The company can make a single contribution uh, into a pension, company pension plan for, for that person uh, of up to 594,000, um, whereas when we compare it, and gain the tax relief on that obviously, uh, where we compare that to a PRSA, the total that can go in is 30% of net relevant earnings of 115,000, which will give you 34,500 going into a pension fund. So straight away we can see the differences from a tax perspective uh, and the benefits thereof of having a company pension structure. And when we talk about company pension structures, we're talking about executive pension plans, uh, self-administered pensions, uh, or group company pension plans. The flip side of this is that there are benefits under a PRSA structure that aren't available under a company pension plan. And one of those is around the retirement date that you can have for a PRSA, which is up to 75. And the latest you can take benefits from a company pension plan is age 70. So you'll have five years there of a um, roll up in terms of the investment and not paying tax on, the, on any drawdowns from, the, from a pension plan for those five years. Um, the other benefit which we're going to go into in a little bit of detail in a second is around phasing retirements. Um, under current legislation, all benefits relating to a company pension plan must be retired at the same time, whereas under a PRSA, it can be split out into a number of different uh, PRSA structures and retired over a period of time. Um, so the, that means that you have the ability to take tax-free lump sums as and when the client needs um, or the, as the individual needs them. Um, and lastly, the uh, biggest difference here is around the treatment of the funds on debt of the individual. So in terms of a company pension structure for a person on an 80,000 salary in a fund of 500,000, how that's paid out if they um, die prior to retirement is a lump sum of four times their salary, which is 320,000. And then the balance on a company pension plan must be used to um, 
provide for spouses or dependents pension. Um, now, obviously at the moment, annuity rates are very, very low and it doesn't optimize in terms of uh, the return that you get on that, on that money. Under a PRSA structure, however, the value of the 500,000 is paid straight into the estate and then distributed as per the, uh, the estate. So under spousal ex exemption, for example, that full 500,000 would transfer to the, the spouse on death. Now, we talked about the flexibility of having a PRSA versus having a company pension plan from a retirement point of view. So what we're going to look at is we're going to assume that a client has built up a fund of a million over a period of time. And as we said, the first drawdown of any pension assets can be between age 60 and up to as far as age 75. And there's no need to retire them all at the same time if they're under a PRSA structure. Um, so if we look at a client who hits 65, we split their PRSA into a number of PRSAs and one of them has 400,000 in it, they can take 100,000 tax free and then the balance transfers to an approved retirement fund. Under an approved retirement fund, there's an annual distribution that must be made uh, in terms of, of um, paying income tax on a certain portion of the fund annually, and that's 4% up to the age of 70, and then from 71, it's, uh, it goes up to 5%. The total amount of assets are over 2 million, and that's going to be 6% uh, in total. So. By splitting your pension assets into a number of different PRSAs, what you're going to end up with is a portion that you can take a tax free lump sum from, and then a balance in an approved retirement fund, and then the rest of your pension assets in PRSAs, which aren't subject to your drawdowns um, in terms of income on an annual basis. So you'll save the income tax on, on that. Now, at a future um, point in time, what you'll do is you'll take the rest of those uh, pension assets. And if we have the 600,000 left over in, in our other PRSA, we will take uh, another 100,000 tax free because that will get us to our 200,000 lifetime limit of, of tax free lump sums from pensions. There'll be another 50,000 taken at a tax rate of 20%. Um, and then the balance will go into the approved retirement fund that you, uh, that you previously set up. So it allows for flexibility over a period of time to manage your drawdowns, manage your tax liabilities for, for an individual. Um, there are some stipulations in terms of how you can um, structure your company pension plans or restructure it in this case. So what we would see is if you have a company pension plan, you use that to fund from your company and extract wealth. And there's probably a conversation a lot of people are having with, with their professional advisors at the moment, uh, is how do I translate what I built up over the last number of years in my company and translate that into personal wealth? The company pension structure is ideal to, to get a level of funds out of the company. The PRSA structure from a retirement planning point of view is probably a more efficient structure in the long term. So what we can do is, as long as the individual has less than 15 years service with their, with their company, you can wind up the pension fund and transfer the benefits to a PRSA. You can then establish a new scheme going forward and fund to your future limits um, if that's what you, if you continue to work and earn. Um, so there is plenty of flexibility in that over a period of time. Now we talked about PR, or, uh, ARFs and we talked about um, the tax treatment on death of your PRSA and your company pension plan. And this is one I want to touch on as well because it's going to flow into a, a, a conversation that I want to have about um, capital acquisitions tax in, in, a, in a moment. So in terms of approved retirement funds, they're extremely flexible in terms of the growth from a tax perspective is, uh, is free of tax. Um, there is a tax on withdrawals, but you can manage that from, a, from an income perspective um, over a period of time, be that through different pension structures or by only taking the minimum amount of uh, income from the, from the funds. But how they are treated on debt uh, is a different matter. So if you are transferring them to a spouse, then they'll obviously receive them tax free. Once they draw those funds from, it becomes an approved retirement fund in their name. Once they draw from that, it becomes taxable in their hands as, as income. If the approved retirement fund is being passed to children, uh, it depends on the age of the child who is going to receive those funds. Um, and 
in terms of a child who's under the age of 20, 21 receiving those funds, it's subject to capital acquisition tax at the current rate of 33%, but they will have their relevant thresholds to go against that. However, if it's passed to a child who's over the age of 21, then the full amount is liable to a special income tax rate of 30%, and there is no uh, threshold available in terms of capital acquisitions tax um, to, the, to the person receiving those funds. So automatically you're going to lose a third of the funds that you've spent your working life trying to build up um, and save for retirement. So that's your a third of your hard-earned money going to revenue. Um, so just to summarize this section, the optimum way to fund for your pension is different to how you plan for your retirement. So the optimum way of funding is through a company pension structure, but there may be more efficient structures for an individual uh, or the professional advisors to use uh, for them um, from a retirement planning perspective. There is a difference and it's, it needs to be highlighted to individuals. There's a difference in how the uh, assets of the pension are treated depending on the structure that they're in if somebody passes away pre-retirement. Uh, timing is also something to take into consideration because we mentioned uh, one, the 15 year rule, um, but also the earlier we start funding for our retirement, then the less of an impact it's gonna have a cash flow from your business perspective in the long term. And phasing your retirement can have a, a huge impact in terms of the flexibility it gives you to phase your drawdown in, a, in an efficient manner over a period of time. Um, I'm going to touch on capital acquisitions tax. Um, the one thing I think that we know for sure is the supports that Emer was talking about earlier on uh, are going to have to be paid for in some form or manner in the next uh, number of years. So one of the areas that we potentially see changing will be the thresholds uh, around um, capital acquisitions tax. They've changed uh, quite frequently over over a number of years and even in 2009 we saw a reduction in those thresholds um, and over the um, no, uh, last number of years, decade, last decade what we've seen is um, an increase in asset value so that's why capital acquisition tax is supposed to be it's becoming more topical uh, as a conversation with clients and, and what can they do to alleviate some of the pressures on their estate um, and the liabilities that will accrue for their uh, children uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and just to sort of put some numbers around it, in 2013, the number of uh, capital acquisitions tax paid in the state was 277 million. By 2018, this had risen to 520 million. And that's an 88% increase in uh, a little over five years. And that is half a billion in assets annually going to the state to, to cover a tax liability. Now, the flip side of this conversation is most clients will say, well, I'm not gonna have a tax liability. Um, I only have some minor assets. I have a family home, I may have a couple of investments and I may have an approved retirement fund. Well, what we can see and what we've seen even in the current environment and during COVID with a, with a stagnating property market is the average house prices in our urban centres are still extremely high. South Dublin, it's close to 580,000. Even in Galway here, we're close to 300,000 in average house prices. So we can see that even a, a modest enough family home could already eat up the thresholds that are available um, to uh, recipients of uh, estates. Um, one way to manage that is by utilising a Section 72 plan, which is a whole of life um, life cover plan uh, where the proceeds, if used to pay an inheritance tax liability, um, do not fall into the estate for inheritance tax rules. Uh, and how does it work? Well, essentially um, what it is, is just a simple life cover policy. It's for the full duration of the person's life. If it's a couple, it's set up as a joint life second death basis because we assume that the full estate is going to transfer to the spouse on the uh, death of the first uh, uh, person in the couple. Um, and then the proceeds will be paid out on the death of the second person. Now, 
what you've probably heard of over the years is, oh, this gets more expensive the, as the years go on and it's very difficult to uh, control the costs and I don't know how much it's going to cost me and it's just going to eat up my money. Well, if it's structured correctly and in the right manner, then it can be quite an efficient tool to use uh, both from a, a wealth protection but also from a wealth generation point of view. And I'm going to go through an example. I think it's the best way to sort of look at it. So if we look at a couple um, who are age 60 uh, with a sum assured or a, a liability of 500,000, if they set it up at age 60 on a joint life basis, the monthly premium, and assuming they're both non-smokers and they get through all the underwriting, is 889 euros per month. Now that might seem like a, a lot of money, but if we run that out to age 100 for the second, uh, for the second life, the total amount paid is 426 odd thousand and the payout is 500,000. So we already see the estate is better off to the tune of 73 odd thousand there. But the other factor to consider is that if the liability is 500,000, the actual assets that need to be retained to uh, cover that is just under 750,000, 746 odd thousand is the is the figure there because we obviously lose a third of it to, to capital acquisitions tax. So that is really where your break even point is in terms of, of uh, the cost benefit com commencing at age 60. So what we've illustrated here is the gray line on the bottom is the premiums paid over the period of time. The CAT liability is the purple line and the teal line at the top there is the cash required to cover the liability. So this can be used quite effectively where there are liquid assets within the estate and you may not want to sell the property there may be an emotional attachment to the property you may be in a situation where we're in a um, similar circumstance to now and you do, don't want to be a forced seller within a uh, within a market that's uh, with depressed prices now the big thing here is if the individuals wait until they're 70 to commence the policy. Then the premiums jump uh, quite significantly from 889 per month uh, to 1741 per month. So you can see by waiting in a period of time, the cost goes up quite significantly. But again, the benefit can be shown that right out until age 105, they won't pay in as much as what they'll need to retain in the estate to cover the liability that, that's, uh, that's present on debt. So it can be quite an effective tool to use. Um, the earlier you start, I think the, the uh, better. I had a case there recently where the client said, well, why not wait 10 years? And I was able to demonstrate by waiting 10 years that they were going to end up paying quite a significant amount more in premiums up to age 100. Um, the other side is, look, don't overinsure yourself. The um, liability, any any amount that's covered above what the cap liability is, uh, is going to be subject to um, capital acquisition tax itself. As I mentioned earlier, it's a extremely effective tool to be used for uh, liquid assets. It can also be used for covering the tax liability that we talked about under an approved retirement fund. So that even that 30% special income tax rate can be used here. Um, you can use a section 72 plan to cover that. Um, the earlier you start, obviously, the, the better it is from a premium point of view and it has less of an impact on cash flow as clients get older. Um, and that's extremely important. There are some restrictions around when you can put this in, in, in place. Um, and the latest is around age 74, 75. But if there's a difference in age between the spouses, it'll be on the younger spouse's um, life that the, the, the premium has costed. So even if you have someone who's 76, 77, it might still be possible to get them cover for this type of cover uh, if their spouse is a couple of years younger than them. Um, just a couple of tips and tricks of the trade. I suppose one of the biggest things is um, that we find a lot of apathy in is around reviewing um, life cover as an individual or as a, even from a company perspective. Uh, and that's probably even more appropriate now given the circumstances around people 
on wage subsidy schemes and people who've been temporarily laid off, uh, it's important to review the covers that you have both from a company perspective, but also from an individual basis. Uh, and you can find that there can be quite significant savings to be had in that. One area um, that can be used quite effectively from, a, from an inherent tax planning point of view is the small gift tax exemption. And I don't think it's used enough in Ireland really, where we can give 3,000 to any individual um, annually and there's no tax liability for either the donor or the recipient in this case. So if you have parents or grandparents who want to pass on money to kids or grandkids, they can give 6,000 uh, annually to each child. And if the children are minor, we can set up uh, investment uh, trusts for those to, to receive those, the, those funds. Uh, and it's a great way of passing on uh, wealth without um, incurring any tax liabilities. Uh, claim all your tax reliefs. This is one where I've seen on a number of occasions where people have income protection plans. Um, and income protection plans, if it's not paid by the company but paid by you personally, is tax relievable at your marginal rate and people haven't been claiming their relief for that. So that's, that's one area to be uh, keep a keen eye on. And the last one is inheritance planning doesn't always mean giving away money to do it. So and a, a really effective trick is to use a Section 73 savings plan. So a savings plan, like any other, the money goes into it on a regular basis. And if after eight years you want to transfer an asset to a child, be it a property, and there's a tax liability there, the proceeds of Section 73 plan can be used to pay that tax liability. Now, the flip side of it is if you don't use it for that, it's still an asset in your own name. So it's just about structuring it and being smart about how we structure things for clients um, to basically keep as many options open for them uh, as, as possible in the future. So that's me. Thank you for your time. And we're happy to go through any questions um, anybody has. Thanks, Nile. Um, just want to see there if there's any questions in the, uh, have come through. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. So the first question is in relation to the wage subsidy. In relation to the WSS, has there been any discussion, regard, discussion regarding the contractual arrange, uh, agreement with employee in respect to their gross pay and how the gross pay has been reduced as a result of the wage subsidy? So effectively, the contractual arrangement is still um, as, as it was prior to, to COVID. Um, and I suppose that was the comment that we were making earlier on in terms of the tapering of the subsidy, that as employees go back to normal, um, working hours and you know the expectation would be that they should be paid you know in uh, line with the actual hours that they're working um, and that they would be tapered off the subsidy uh, where that brings them above their um, average weekly net pay from January and February. Um, I know that doesn't give an employer a great result from the perspective of needing the support going forward but that is the current position uh, with revenue um, on that. So I suppose it does come down very much to a legal um, employment law question, um, but effectively that's where things are at at the moment on that one. Um, the next question, are revenue being actively lobbied to have filing deadlines extended, not alone, where our own staff working less hours, our clients were either closed or working from home and it takes a lot longer to get records and queries sorted. We were two, we're two months behind and find it difficult. Um, yeah, Mary, I think that you're, you're not alone there, and I suppose with the study leave as well, um, which is obviously a big issue for um, the likes of ourselves as well, where you have a lot of staff going out on study leave later now where the exams have been extended. Um, it is an issue in terms of compliance, both CT and uh, personal tax. Um, and the answer is yes, we have, um, I, I know certainly the larger accountancy firms have all lobbied as have GT. It has been brought up at TALC, but as of yet, we've had no uh, formal um, extension of the dates. Um, I think revenue are probably going to take a wait and see approach on that, but I, I do think you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the point has been made, as I said, from the point of view of the exam leave and also the fact that um, businesses were unable to work as normal and um, that we are probably behind where we need to be normally. Um, another question here on the wage subsidy, regard, or sorry, the debt warehousing restructuring. What are the thoughts of likelihood of debts been written off? I think that will come down very much to um, you know, in, in due course, we're looking at it, the warehousing only applying for COVID-19 related uh, deaths. 
So it, it would be very much a case of um, if it was ending up that the business was not going to reopen, obviously um, that would come into conversation then. In terms of write-offs, there's absolutely no expectation that the write-off will happen because revenue, there's no dead end date as to when that debt has to be paid the COVID-19 period. Um, as I mentioned during the presentation, you have, a, you have effectively a 12 month interest free period. And then after that 12 month expires, it's a 3% rate applying until all the debt is cleared. And if that takes a period of two, three, four years, the 3% rate is the rate that applies. Um, so uh, I think that's where we stand on that at the moment. Next question is for Niall. Can Niall provide details on the income tax and CAT impact of leaving an ARF to a niece or nephew as part of an inheritance? Niall, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so the first thing we need to determine there is whether the niece or nephew is over the age of 21 when they receive the assets. So if they're over the age of 21, there's no threshold given for, it's not subject to, to capital acquisitions tax, but the, and there's no threshold given, and the full amount of the ARF will be subject to a special rate of income tax of 30%. So if we take a 600,000 approved retirement fund, 30% uh, of that is going to be 180,000 is going to go in tax. If they're under the age 21, they will have their threshold. So as a niece or nephew, it'll be 32,000. Um, and that will come off the 600,000 before uh, the rate of 33% is applied to the funds. Thanks, Niall. Um, thanks, Niall, for that. Um, Next question is again regarding the subsidy and it is uh, what proofs will employers be expected to supply to revenue to support their 25% reduction in turnover? Also revenue have said in yesterday's guidance that they would expect the employer contribution to wages to increase as business returns to normal. Any further guidance on what level of top up will be expected? Um, so in terms of the, the proofs and supports, um, Connor, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the reduction in turnover, um, they have given the example um, of looking at quarter two 2019 versus quarter two 2020, looking at quarter one 2020 against quarter two 2020, looking also at budgets and forecasts. Like I was on a client call yesterday with a client where they're in a very much a growth phase of the, the business at the moment. Their turnover for, from 2019 to 2020 year on year was expected to increase by about 50%. Uh, um, now it's looking like that they're going to actually be about 40% behind the forecast. But if you look at it against quarter two, 2019, they haven't come back by, 20, by that 25%. And um, so very much the rationale being adopted in that case was, well, we report to the US, we have given um, their HQ to the US, we have given the forecast, we have budgets, we have minutes of meetings um, prior to COVID ever kicking off. We had all of this documented and we have rationale for why we thought those projected figures were realistic and achievable. And um, so I think certainly looking at cash flows, looking at budgets, looking at forecasts that were done at the back end of 2019 before COVID became um, a concern for any businesses, that should be um, compelling evidence there. I think certainly keeping record of all board minutes, Connor, that have been had in terms of the rationale uh, for why businesses entered into the scheme at the outset. And now if they're continuing to claim the subsidy to the end of August, why they believe they still continue to qualify. And as I mentioned earlier, it has moved on now from the turnover. It's still quarter two turnover. We're looking at the decline in, but it's more the ability to pay becoming more um, of the question that needs to be answered. Um, in terms of the level of the contribution to wages, I suppose the expectation will be that, um, the, as I mentioned, in terms of the contract point that was made earlier, and um, the expectation from revenue is that you would start to pay your staff for the hours that they're working. So obviously the hospitality sector is one that jumps to mind here for me, where obviously their ability to pay, they might have staff back working 40 hours a week, but they may not have the cash reserves available immediately to pay that 40 hour pay period. They're very much stuck in the middle here in terms of um, if they don't claim the subsidy for the week in question, because they're paying their staff the full 40 hours that they worked. Um, and with tapering that end up with very little subsidy. It, it's a bit of a catch-22, but there's been no guidance at this stage from revenue on big cases like that. All that they're saying is you apply the subsidy as per the rules um, that we, we looked at very briefly there, um, but it, it very much you apply it based on the average weekly net pay for January, February, and if tapering is to apply, it does, it'll automatically taper. You don't have control over it as such now the way it's been set up. 
through um, payroll software and through revenue with themselves, they will not pay a subsidy in excess of um, what is due um, based on whatever figure you populate as, as gross pay or gross contribution from the employer. Um, so I, I know it doesn't fully answer the question, but at this stage, it's whatever the employer should be paying to the employee should be um, paid across. And now I have one further question here for you. Um, can our pension be transferred to our family member in another com country? And would that be taxed in both countries or only one? Um, okay, so if it's a pay, I'm assuming first off that the question is in relation to if you pass away and what happens. It, it will depend on whether or not that pension is a pension or an approved retirement fund. So is a pre or post retirement um, and the recipient, depending on who the recipient is as well, um, that we were kind of touching on for the approved retirement fund. Um, what I might do is touch base with the, the that person directly uh, to just flesh it out a little bit more in terms of what they're what they're really looking to to ask there, um, and I can touch base with them directly and, and just give them a, a more comprehensive answer. Thanks, Niall. I think just one point probably to add to that as well, Niall, would be I think it'll it'll depend on whether or not it's an asset um, in terms of how it's going to be treated for capital acquisitions tax purposes, and the residency of the individual may come into that. So it's exactly. just something else to bear in mind there as well. Um, but yeah, uh, as you've said, um, it, that came in from Noella. So if you want to reach out to Noella directly, Noella, please do. Um, just wondering if there's any other questions. I, I don't have any more here. Um, okay, if anybody wants to reach out to any of us, um, as I said, the slides will be circulated to everyone who's attended. Um, more than happy to um, take uh, an email or a call or, or details are on the slides so please feel free to reach out to any of us who um, whoever's the most relevant person to your query and um, very happy to deal with it then um, so if there's no further questions I'd just like to say thank you very much on behalf of, of Grant Thornton um, for um, diving in today and for attending the webinar have a lovely day thank you